Um, dear Jesus, thank you for today, Lord. Thank you that um, we get to be here, Lord, that we get to gather and that we get to worship you, Lord. I pray that you move through each and every one of us, Lord, and that we'll be ready to receive what it is that you have to say. Um, in Jesus' name, amen. So um, as you can probably tell from the screen, my, um, the title of my sermon today is called Fear Not. And we'll be reading from 1 Kings 19, verse 1 to 18. But before we go into that, um, I want to give a little bit of context um, so in the chapter before, which is um, 1 Kings 18, there was a bit of a showdown between these two groups of prophets. So the first one was um, Elijah, which was God's prophet, who we go for Elijah, he's on our team. And then um, the other prophets who were um, prophets of a uh, God called Baal and his um, like an idol, he's a statue basically. So um, yeah, and so basically each group had like a little, a bull, on an altar, so Elijah had his, and then the prophets of Baal had theirs, and um, they were each going to pray to their God, and whichever God sent fire from heaven to burn up the bull was basically like the true God. So they were basically like having a contest, pretty much, which is um, would have been pretty cool to watch. I kind of wish I saw that, but you know that's okay. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. So um, yeah, the prophets of Baal were like praising. They went first, so they were like. Um, Worship, well, singing songs and they were like praying to their God and doing dances and like stuff, but nothing happened. It was, yeah, literally nothing happened. There wasn't even like a teensy tiny wincy bit of smoke, nothing. <laughs> um, and so Elijah was like kind of mocking them, kind of be like, maybe your God's asleep. Maybe you need to like sing louder, guys. And so they did and still nothing happened. Um, and it went on for hours and they finally gave up because they were tired. So um, yeah, and so it was Elijah's turn. And before Elijah went, he um, asked people to pour 12 large jars of water onto the bull and the altar and the dirt around it. So it was just water everywhere because he wanted the people of Israel to know that it was God who sent the fire. It wasn't like an accidental bushfire or something. He wanted the people to know it was God. And so, um, yeah, that happened. And then Elijah prayed and fire came down from heaven, which is pretty cool. Um, so basically the point of that was to say that Elijah had power, like he was God's um, prophet. He was basically like best friends with God. He was like super tight. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, so that's basically where that story ended and our story today starts. So um, 1 Kings 19, um, verse 1 to 18. So, <laughs> yeah. What can we say? The youth love the Bible, guys. <laughs> um so starting with verse one. So when Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. So um, King Ahab is the king of Israel at the time and Jezebel is his wife and she was the one who introduced, um, who introduced Baal to the people of Israel. So yeah, we don't really like her. Um, <laughs> verse two. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the gods strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up. Um, he looked around and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate, drank and lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, get up and eat some more or the journey ahead will be too much for you. Then he got up, ate and drank and the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. There he came to a cave where he spent the night. But the Lord said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left alive, and now they are trying to kill me too. Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. As Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face around his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And a voice said, what are you doing here, Elijah? 
Um, verse 14, he replied again, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left and now they are trying to kill me too. Then the Lord told him, go back the same way you came and travel to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, anoint Hazel to be king of Aram, then anoint Jehu, son of Nimishi, to be king of Israel, and anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from the town of Abel-Meholah, to replace you as my prophet. Anyone who escapes from Hazel will be killed by Jehu, and everyone who escapes Jehu will be killed by Elisha. Yet I will preserve 7,000 others in Israel who have never bowed down to Baal or kissed him. It's a little bit of a long passage, so we're going to go back um, through a couple of verses and sort of unpack it a little bit. Um, so in verse 2, uh, it says, So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the gods strike me and even kill me, if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you, just as you killed them. Um, like I mentioned before, Jezebel was the queen, basically. She was King Ahab's wife. So she had the power to go tell an army, go find Elijah, we're going to kill him. Or she could tell just probably two people and they'd probably be able to do it. Um, Yet she didn't do that. She sent a messenger to Elijah. Like, in a hypothetical world, I just want you guys to imagine for a little second that there was somebody you didn't like and you sort of wanted to kill them, which we're not going to do because that's bad, guys. But if you wanted to, <laughs> would you send a messenger? Would you text him and be like, oh, um, I'm going to kill you tomorrow. Have fun. No, you wouldn't do that. You'd send a hitman, right, to actually do the job. And so it sort of got me thinking, right, why would Jezebel send a messenger? Why, why didn't she send an army? She could have. She had the power to. And um, what, what, what I sort of got from that was, like, Jezebel didn't actually have the power. Like, she had the physical power, but God had the power over her. And if God didn't want Elijah to die, he wasn't going to die. And if... God wanted Elijah to die, he would die, but he didn't. So um, God didn't want Elijah to die. He wanted Elijah to still be alive. He had more things that he needed Elijah to do. And Jezebel actually had no power to do anything to Elijah. Unless God commanded it, she couldn't do it. And, and like for what I got from that is um, I'm leaning more towards the fact that Jezebel just wanted to scare Elijah. She wanted Elijah to believe that she had the power over God, that she had the power over Elijah, which we know she didn't, but it worked. Elijah was scared and it's super easy to judge, but we do like the exact same thing. Like we know that God has a plan for us. We know that God is God. We know that he... Um, commands the sun to rise in the morning and the sun to set at night. We know, we know that, but we don't always believe that. And um, like we do the exact same thing as Elijah did. A lot of the times we take things to the extreme. Like, for example, if someone says to me, oh, Jade, um, can we catch up later this afternoon? I have something important to tell you. Or can we catch up tomorrow? I need to talk to you about something. I'm automatically going to the worst situation possible. Like, what did I do? Did I, um, I don't know, did I accidentally cheat on a test? Am I about to get kicked off the worship team? Did I like make somebody upset? Did I offend them? I really don't know. And I always go to the worst situation possible. Yet most of the time, it ends up being like the most encouraging meeting I've ever had in my entire life. <laughs> like it's, we always take it to the extreme, even though it doesn't need to be. Um, yeah. And in verse four, um, it says that um, Elijah said that I've had enough. Take my life for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. And Elijah would have thought that his life was ending. He would have thought that all the hard work he, do he had done was pointless. He would have thought that um, he would have been disappointed that the people didn't repent. He would have been upset at God for telling him to do this crazy job, upset at the people for not listening and probably even upset him himself for not being good enough to help the people. And um, yeah, he, he was fed up. He was totally done. And um, in verse 8, it says that Elijah um, traveled for 40 days and 40 nights. And then God asked him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Eli Elijah walked in the complete opposite direction that Jesus, that God told him to be in. Like God called Elijah to be a prophet to the Israelites. Yet he was like walking in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, like not with people, 
Like he can't really like be a prophet for the people if there's no people. Like he was doing the complete opposite to what God had um, told him to do. He was fed up and he was totally done with life. Um, yeah, it reminds me of another um, story in the Bible of another prophet named Jonah. And God told Jonah to go, um, to go preach to these people um, in the city called Nineveh. And the Ninevites were pretty bad people. Like, they were pretty evil. <laughs> like, um, and so Jonah was like, I don't want to do it. Like, no, they, they don't deserve to be um, forgiven. They don't deserve to be able to repent. But, um, and so he, like, walked it. Well, he didn't walk in the opposite direction. He, catched, he caught a boat and he, like, sailed in the complete opposite direction. He went to t- a little island called Tarshish, but um, he was doing the complete opposite of what God told him to do. But God found him on that ship. He caused, um, there was a storm, right? And so Elijah ended up in the, in the ocean and then it, like a fish ate him. And so he ended up in a fish, which is kind of gross. And if I was in a fish, I would probably hate life too. Like it's kind of gross. It's stinky and smelly and g- just gross. You, I wouldn't want to be there. Um, <laughs> but God found him in the middle of that um, whale or that fish, whatever it was, he was, God found him, God showed up, God saw him. And even though Jonah wasn't doing what God told him to do, God still found him, still looked for him. And it just really reminded me that God never gives up on us. Even if we've disobeyed, even if we've walked in the opposite direction, he doesn't give up on us. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. No matter whether we're completely in the opposite direction. Whether we're doing exactly what it is he wants us to do, he will always love us, he always chooses us, and we will always be his children. Um, yes, in verse 10 and verse 14, um, it says, um, yeah, if we look closely, they're basically, he said the exact same thing. It's not an error, I promise. I didn't, like, write it out wrong. It's the ex- He says the exact same thing, like, Literally the exact same thing, like to the letter, everything's the same. He would have rehearsed his problems in his mind in those 40 days. When we, when we leave ourselves alone, we, re- we repeat what it is that we have that's wrong. We keep thinking about it. Like, I do that all the time. Right? Yeah, it's, it, yeah. Anyway, the point is he kept repeating the problems that he had in his life. He forgot what it is that God had already done for him. And, but the one thing I do want to point out is that Elijah did go to God. He didn't go and complain about his bad life to his friends. He went to God who he knew that God would give him a solution. God would give him hope. Elijah didn't go to his friends because we all know, well, we don't all know, but we can, we can guess that Elijah's friends would have been like, oh, Elijah, I'm so sorry that your life sucks. I'm so sorry. Like, you're such a good person. Like, how rude of Jezebel to, like, want to kill you. Like, gosh, rude. <laughs> we all know that Elijah's Elijah's friends would have just suck up, sucked up to him. They would have been like, you're so amazing. There's no one better than you. But he still would have been in the exact same situation as he was before he went and spoke to his friends. And But Elijah went to God and God gave Elijah hope. God gave him a solution. In um, verse 15 to verse 18, it says that um, God told um, Elijah to go back the way he came and then he gave him a whole bunch of like things of what's going to happen. But if Elijah didn't go to God, he wouldn't have the solution. He would still be stuck in that place of fear, in that place of desperation, in the place of my life sucks. But he went to God and he chose God and God moved him into um, into the solution. God gave him the solution. God gave him the hope. And when we go to God, he gives us the hope. He gives us the solution. We don't have to sit in... Um, in the fear, we don't have to sit in the trouble, but we can sit in the heart. We can sit in what it is that God has for us. And um, the devil was using Jezebel to hold Elijah back. The only thing that can keep us from not doing God's will is our own self and our own fear and our own insecurities. No person can stop us. No devil, no demon, no nothing can stop us from doing what it is that God has called us to do. Yet, the devil, and the devil knows this. So he used Jezebel to try scare Elijah, to stop Elijah from doing what it is that he knows. What, yeah. Stop Elijah from doing what it is that he knows God wants him to do. Um, and so um, 
Anxiety and fear shouldn't hold us back. It shouldn't be the one to keep us in our little circle of life sucks. Just, okay, a couple of like last year sometime, dad was talking, um, he preached a sermon about going around the mountain. And when we don't, and when we stay in that um, place of anxiety, in that place of fear, we are going around the mountain like the Israelites for 40 years, around and around and around. And that's what we do when we let a um, yeah, when we let anxiety, when we let fear um, take hold of us, like it is not our identity and it doesn't have to be. God has called us to be his children. He has called us to be children of God. And that is what it is. That is who we are. And um, yeah, so when, and I'm not saying that we won't get scared. Like we still get scared. Like I'm, I, I'm scared standing up here talking to you guys because I know you're lovely people and you have like beautiful faces and everything, but it's still intimidating. You're all looking at me like it's, it's scary. But like, I know that I didn't let, I'm not letting it stop me from still talking to you. As you may have noticed, I'm still here. Like I'm still talking. And that's what we shouldn't, we shouldn't be letting the fear and the anxiety stop us. And when we're scared, I know when we're scared, I, I, a lot of the time I say, oh, I'm so scared right now. I hate saying that because that's saying I am scared, that I am fear, that it is my identity and it is not. My identity is in Jesus Christ and he is my God and he is my father and he is the one who has given me life and I'm his child. And so if you have to say it, say I feel scared, guys. I, re- I encourage you, I feel scared. No, I am scared because that's bad. <laughs> um, yeah, and like God has given us the ability to fight back. Like we can fight back. In 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, it says that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of peace. And God gives us peace. He doesn't give us fear. And um, He has chosen to give us like peace. Fear isn't from Him. Fear is from the devil. Fear is from our own insecurities. But He chose to give us peace. He gives us peace. All we have to do is ask. And what heaven started, hell cannot stop. Like no devil, no person, no thing can stop you from doing that thing that God's called you to do. No person can take away that dream or that idea because God always gives it. If he gives it to you, he's going to give you the ability to keep going. He's not just going to give it to you and be like, work it out yourself. No, he's going to give you the ability to keep going and to keep moving in what it is that he has for you. And um, Elijah was scared. He was scared that Jezebel was going to be able to kill him. Um, he was scared that he was going to lose his life. But um, if we keep reading in 2 Kings 2 verse 11, I don't have a slide for this, sorry guys. But um, it says that, um, well, it basically talks about how Elijah went to heaven. And it says that Elijah went to heaven in a chariot of fire. He didn't actually die. Like there was no sword. He didn't die. There was no blood. He didn't actually die. There was no actual body left. He just went up into heaven and he was scared of something that never ended up happening. And a lot of the times we're scared of something that never ends up happening. Like how many times, yeah, how many times do we like go into the ocean and be like, oh my gosh, what if a shark eats me, guys? Has a shark ever eaten us? No, we're still here. Like a lot of the time we're scared of things that never actually happens. Like, and Elijah was scared of dying when really he didn't have to be. Like he never ended up, it wasn't his time and it wasn't what God had for him. Um, there's this song by um, Gable Price and Friends um, called Treason. It's a really good song. You should totally listen to it if you have time. Um, but the chorus says, um, is it really heroic to be broken on purpose? Is it some kind of honour to keep living in the dark? Is it really heroic to be broken on purpose or is it treason to your heart? And I don't know. Fear is a choice. It's like a, not just from that song, but fear is a choice. It is a choice to be um, in that dark place. It is a choice to keep living in the dark. It's a, it's living in the dark. If you're walking through hell, you're not going to stop in hell. You're going to keep walking, right? And like you don't want to stay in that place of darkness. You don't want to stay in that place of fear because it's a choice. We have a choice to move forward, to move into what it is that God has for us. And um, I just have a couple points on how we can focus on God instead of focusing on um, our fear. And the first one is to um, renew your mind. And um, in Romans 12 verse 2, it says, Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And um, Elijah thought he was the victim. 
He thought that he was the one that was going to die because he was... He did all these things for God, yet he was going to die because of it. But really, Elijah was victorious. He just never seemed to see it. Like literally the chapter before, which was like a couple days before, Elijah literally, fire came down from heaven. Like seriously, <laughs> it's a, it's a, it would have been amazing. Yet he was still stuck in that place of, um, of fear, of being a victim. Um, but scriptures... Yeah, so Elijah went to God, right? And he sought God's opinion. He sought God's solution and God's hope. And we can do that as well. Like, especially through God's, like through the scriptures in the Bible, like they're our weapon. Like if, um, yeah, if we're feeling like we're not loved, like we aren't God's creation, we can remember that scripture, I am God's master, masterpiece. He has created us anew. And like his, there's so many scriptures for any situation it is that we're in. And all we have to do is focus our minds, renew our minds and focus on him. And he gives us that peace. Um, when I was like 11, well, between like the ages of like 11 and 13, the whole period, pretty much. Um, I was terrified of death. Like I would literally go to sleep crying um, because I was terrified. Like I was so scared. I knew that hell um, exists and that heaven exists and I knew that Jesus was God, but I was so scared that maybe I said the prayer wrong and maybe I wasn't going to go into heaven. Maybe I was going to go to hell. And I would literally cry myself to sleep. Like, I'm not even kidding. Like, for two years straight, every night I would cry. And, um, yeah, I would just be so scared that I wasn't, that I wasn't good enough, that I wasn't going to make it, that I said something wrong that I didn't believe enough. Maybe I didn't believe hard enough. Maybe I was just wrong. But, um, yeah, guys. <laughs> um, yeah, I was just scared. I was stuck in a place of fear. Like, I literally could not go to sleep without crying. Like, I was just crying every night. And um, after, like, quite a few talks with mom and dad because... I was crying a lot. Um, <laughs> after quite a few conversations, I finally realized that um, I just needed to focus on God. I needed to focus on what it is that he was saying, what it is that um, I know is true, what it is that is true, what it is that he has said. Like Romans um, 10 verse 9, which says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And I remembered that verse. I was like, I said that, I've confessed it, I believe I will be saved. And I had to keep reminding myself of that. And, um, and I realized that most of my fear was coming at night. When I was, during the day, I was completely fine. Like I was fine at church, fine at school, fine at home. But it was when I was at night trying to sleep just alone with my thoughts, that's when, that's when the fear came. That's when the thoughts came. And um, so I started listening to, to preaching, to worship, to the audio Bible at night because I knew that I needed God's thoughts in my mind, not my own thoughts, not my own ideas, not any ideas that I can get from the devil, not my own fears. I needed God's thoughts and God's ideas and God's um, God's spirit needs, needed to be in me so I wouldn't be scared. And so, um, yeah, I started listening to preaching. I started listening to worship and to like the audio Bible. And um, I, I loved it to be completely honest. I didn't cry. Like I could actually go to sleep and not be scared and still know that I would go to heaven. Even if, yeah, one of the, yeah, one of the biggest things I would, was scared of is what if the rapture happened and I like didn't wake up? Like, what if, what if I was still asleep because I was sleeping so much and I didn't hear, like, the trumpet or whatever it is that was going to call everybody to go up to heaven? What if I didn't hear it? Like, I was so scared that I would wake up and find an empty house, that I would wake up to just myself and the cats. Like, <laughs> at least I had the cats, but, like, my family, <laughs> I was so scared. And, like, when I started listening to the preaching and started listening to the worship and the Bible, like, I wasn't scared. Like, I knew that if I believed, I would be saved. And, like, I, re I renewed my mind onto Jesus. Like, I fixed my thoughts on him. And, um, yeah, 
I still listen to preaching and worship at night because it's just comforting now. Like, I know that he's with me and I can feel him in, like, I can feel his presence in my room when I sleep now. And I don't feel alone. And yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, anyways, next point is um, um, to travel to God's presence. So in Philippians 4 verse um, six to seven, it says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he's done. Then you will experience God's peace, which can exceed anything we can understand. His peace will guide your hearts and minds as you live in Jesus Christ. Um, yeah, I really like this verse. It's a really good verse. Um, but as you may have noticed, it says, don't worry about anything, but instead we should pray about everything. Like it doesn't just say don't worry because how am I supposed to just not worry? That's like not a thing. Like <laughs> I, I don't have to worry because I can pray about it instead. Like it gives me an option to like instead of something to do. Like the condition of having peace, having God's peace, which is a better peace than any peace we could ever get, is to just give God our worries. When I pray and when I um, give my worries to God, he gives me his peace. It's sort of like an exchange thing. Like we, I trade it out. I trade out my worries for peace. I feel like that's a better trade. Like I would much rather have my, I'd much rather have peace than my worries. And if, I, he, if we give it to him, he'll take it and he'll give us peace. Like all we have to do is give it to him. All we have to do is ask. And um, yeah, I just really like those verses. Um, my next point is to... Um, ask him for help. So in Psalm 34 verse 4, it says, I prayed to the Lord and he answered me. He freed me from all my fears. And um, yeah, basically, whenever we ask God, he'll answer us. Like he's not going to not answer us. Um, funny story, a while ago when I was, oh, I was maybe like 13 or something. I don't know. The point is I was cooking something, a cake maybe. I don't know. Um, but I remember I, mom was like out shopping and I just needed to know what to do for the next part because the instructions was very unclear and I was confused. So I called mom. She didn't answer. Wasn't too unusual. So it's okay. I left it a few minutes and then I called her again. She didn't answer. <laughs> then I called her again and still no answer. And I'm pretty sure I called 15 times. I'm not even kidding. Like it literally said, you know how it says um, the person's name and then in brackets how many times you've called them? It said 15. <laughs> literally 15 times and she did not answer <laughs> she finally called me back and then told me what to do with the cake and then it was fine but um the point of that story is God always answers his phone unlike my mother which we love <laughs> doesn't always answer her phone but God always answers his phone he's always there he's always ready to answer us and when we pray that's basically our telephone like we pray that's basically us calling God and he answers us by giving us the peace and by giving us, um, yeah, by giving us his peace, he answers us, right? And so, yeah, all we have to do is ask, ask him for help and he will give us that peace that it is um, that we need. And my last point um, is to use gratitude or we'll be thankful um, and remember what it is that he has already done. So in um, verse six again in Philippians four, it says, thank him um, for all that he has done. And like when we remember what it is that God has done, it's really hard to remember, like to think about the hard problems that we're in right now. Like um, anxiety and gratitude, this is a scientific fact, guys. Anxiety and gratitude physically cannot be in your brain at the exact same time. It's either going to be anxiety or it's going to be um, gratitude. And I don't know about you guys, but I'd much rather be thankful <laughs> than be scared. <laughs> like up to you, but like, thankful is so much better like um and like they cannot coexist in the brain at the exact same time so when we focus on anxiety we focus on anxiety when we focus on gratitude we physically cannot be scared we remember what God has done and he gives us peace and um I okay last night I was just like sitting in my bed and I have a bookshelf like next to my bed and I was looking at my bookshelf and there was um I've got a book that um it's called The Art of Looking Up. And in the book is basically um, just a whole bunch of like cathedrals and like murals and stuff where they paint the roof. 
like so cool, kind of like the, like the Sistine Chapel and like all those sort of paintings. It was in a book. It's pretty cool. I really like that book. And the sides come out and it like goes really big. It's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> um, but basically I was looking at that book and like it reminded me that we have to actually look up to see those beautiful paintings. Like if we're, um, if I'm, if, imagine I went into like the Sistine Chapel and all I did was look at the ground. Like, oh, I like this floor. I don't actually look up and see the amazing masterpiece that is on the roof. And like, it's the same thing. When we have, when we have fear, we're looking at the ground. We're looking at the problems. We're looking at a plain brown wooden floor, right? When we could be looking up and we could be looking at a beautiful masterpiece and we can look up through gratitude. When we have gratitude and when we thank God for what it is that we've done and when we praise him, we're looking upwards and we're looking at all the good things he's already done and we're looking at the amazing painting and the amazing masterpiece that it already is and that is still continuing to move. And um, yeah, I'd much rather look Again, much rather look at the painting than the ground, like, yeah. And um, yeah, so basically, um, just to recap, my four points was to renew your mind, travel to God's presence, ask him for help, and to use gratitude. And um, before we close up, I just want um, people to know that I'm not attacking anybody. I'm not judging you if you get scared. I'm not judging you if you have anxiety, because trust me, I still get scared, like, like I said before, I love you guys, but it's scary. <laughs> like, um, I still get it, and I'm not judging you if you have it. I'm just, and this is entirely from my own experiences as well. Like, I'm not being like, oh, you need to be better. How dare you be scared? Like, no, I'm not saying that. Like, I'm just, I'm sharing with you what helped me. What helped me look, instead of looking at the ground, to look up at God instead. What helped me? And I'm just trying to encourage you guys and trying to help you as well. So just so you know, I'm not attacking you, I promise. I love you guys. That's why I'm, that's why I'm sharing this. That's why I'm here because, no offence, but if I didn't love you, I'd kind of like sitting in that chair, comfortable in my seat that I like. <laughs> like but I'm, I'm trying to help you guys. I'm trying to um, share with you what that has helped me and what I feel like can help you as well if you, um, yeah, if you choose. But at the same time, um, God works in different ways for every one of us as well. So it's not a cookie cutter response that if you do these four things, you'll be completely fine, but they'll help you and they'll help you. They're like stepping stones and everyone has their own stepping stones. And these were my stepping stones and I'm sure you might have other stepping stones, but um, yeah, just want to help add to your little path. You're welcome. Um, yeah. Amen. Done now. Awesome. Thank you, Jade. What a great word. Well, just before we close up, just a couple of things. Maybe first of all, maybe you're here today and you're, you've never really experienced a relationship with God. Maybe you're here today and you're like, I hear what Jade is saying, but I don't really know who Jesus is. I, I know about him, but I don't experience a relationship with him. And so the first thing I'd like to do is I'd like to give us an opportunity for those of us who are in that category to be at peace with God. So let's all close our eyes for a moment. And maybe you're here and you're like, what's it all about? Well, in the beginning, God created us to be in relationship with him. But then sin separated us from God. Disobedience made us distant from him. But then Jesus came in obedience to the Father and he died and made a way for us to be made right with him. And if we believe in him and confess him, the Bible says that we are united back with him, in relationship with him. And so if that's you today, the good news is it's a matter of believing in your heart and confessing that he's Jesus. And I want to help you do that today if that's you. So what I'm going to ask if that's you to lift up your hand as an act of surrender while we've all got our eyes closed. I'd like you to lift up your hand to say, yes, God, I want you in my life. Thank you, Jesus. Now I want us all to repeat this prayer after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I come before you and I acknowledge that you are God. I repent of my ways and accept you 
and your righteousness. Today, I choose to become your child. And today, I receive you as my Father. In Jesus' name. And the people of God say, Amen.